Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cladicast episode 33. I'm Steve Tudor. I'm John Cage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm Andy. Hi. Oh, dear. Wake up, Lewis. Last time we did this, both Andy and I went at the same time, so I thought I'll wait for him to go this time. Oh, he's waiting for me. We're both going to go at the same time. Oh, no. Look, it's been it's been a tough day. It's been a tough day. By the way, welcome to the Polyhedron Cladicast. This is supposedly a podcast about tabletop gaming. Um, I say that supposedly because we will go down many a rabbit hole. Indeed we will. I swear we, we like rabbit it hole. There. Indeed, it's, it's, it's warm in this cold weather. It is chilly today, actually, isn't it? Brass monkey had to defrost the calf the first time. Really? I've done it twice already. Yeah. Coming back from Wolverhampton. Um, it's been minus... It was minus two here this morning. Minus two! It's pretty chilly, this side of the hill. I had to put a T-shirt on this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you don't want to see how he walks into work most days. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually been told many a time to take to, to, to hide the mankini. Yeah, apparently it's not it's not suitable attire for a professional professional environment. I don't know why. <laughs> We're a casual place, but there are limits, Andy. That's true. That's true. Is, was it was it the was it the nipple rubbing I did? Was that what put you off? I mean, that's just one of many things. <laughs> <laughs> so I think is this uh, episode thirty three? Is that right? Thirty three. We're on. Was it thirty three? Yeah. Bloody hell! Really? Yeah. It's bonkers. Yeah, we've managed to keep going for 33. I thought it was only and on 32. And people are still listening to us. I know. <laughs> I thought it was only 32. Obviously, the last one was, um, just, it was just erased from my brain, given its content. Well, obviously. <laughs> Speaking of content, we've had an email. Have we? Ooh. Yeah. Well, we, get more than, we get quite a few emails, to be fair. Well, this one isn't a cease and desist order. Oh, oh right, okay. <laughs> or can you please tie Andy up and stop him swearing at your email? <laughs> Which, by the way, I have actually had a cease and desist order for Polyhedron Collider off Lego. Really? Oh, yeah. oh remember <laughs> you telling me about that? Yes. Didn't you rob one of their images or something? Um, there was uh, leaked images. Uh, oh god, last was it last year or the year before? It must, must have been the last the year before when Force Awakens was about to come out. Right. There was leaked images of all the Lego sets, the Force Awakens Lego sets. And I used to do regular X-Wing articles on the website then saying, like, okay, these are the new ships we can expect to see in X-Wing because whatever turns up in the films is going to turn up, you know, weeks later. Well, it ended up that these um, images of the Lola Lego kits were unofficially leaked. So someone had, um, I wouldn't say hacked, but people weren't supposed to have them. Right. So uh, Lego were going and finding whoever had these <laughs> images on their website and rather politely saying, you do not own the copyright to display these images. Please remove them immediately. Yeah. Sir, well, yes, sir. Fair. However, most of the ships had already been named and was images of them on things like Wikipedia already, so... Oh, well. <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a chuckle every time, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> it's still good. <laughs> so what's this email then? Yes, so this is from Phil the Sheep. Ah. Oh. So he says, hello chaps. Hello. Thought I'd drop you a line about the show. I'm very much enjoying all the ramshackle nonsense that you spew, especially in that golden five minutes of the show when you actually remember to talk about board games. <laughs> Coming up later on the show... <laughs> we are we are clearly trying too hard. Five minutes is far too much. So he says he's got a wonderful Bluetooth waterproof speaker a short while ago that enables me to play podcasts remotely via his phone. Nice. Why am I telling you this? Well, it means that I can make use of the time when I shower to listen to podcasts. So every time you record, just think, I could be listening to you whilst soaping up my hairy body. There's a wonderful thought to spur you on. Enjoy the rest of the recording. <laughs> I feel sick. <laughs> well, at least he could have said, you know, he, he admitted he said hairy body rather than hairy ball sack, so we've been at least spared that. <laughs> I never actually met the chap, so I've just got this image of this sheep soaping itself up in the shower. No, for, Steve and I have met him. Do you know the first thing he said to me when he met us? He called us... <laughs> he actually, he pulled, he pulled me closer and he whispered in my ear, he said... <laughs> True story. Uh... And that's why he's still listening, see? Mm. <laughs> one of us. One of us. <laughs> Have you still got that, 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 that air horn, Steve? Yes. That's air good, horn. yes. <laughs> air horn's all prepped and good to go. In fact, presumably it's gone off several times already. <laughs> Twice. Yes. Twice. But that was a direct quote, so strictly speaking, I've not sworn yet. 
<laughs> well, I mean, it did still come out of your mouth, didn't it? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was swearing by proxy. Come on. Let's actually talk about some games, shall we? Yes. Go on. Good then. idea. Now we're pepped up from the <laughs> one bit of fan mail we've ever had. It's going on the fridge, that is. Excellent. That's the hair, <laughs> Phil. You're on the fridge. <laughs> what's, this, what's this, dear? It's a pony, Daddy. Is it? Oh, all right. Well done, dear. Well done. <laughs> well done, Phil. <laughs> so we have played some games this month, haven't we? This month, yes. <laughs> it used to be this week. It's now this month, isn't it? <laughs> oh, good Lord. Wow. <sighs> yeah, we, we we have kind of devolved into a kind of monthly schedule now rather than fortnight schedule, but it just means that um, you'll just pine for us even longer. <laughs> yeah, you tell yourself that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, the game we played. Now, me and John played a game uh, a couple of weekends back. We do, indeed. A little fantasy adventure game. The Gloom of Kilfroth. <laughs> Kilfroth. <laughs> I don't know why I keep hearing that in my head every time I read it. It's obviously Kilfroth. Says, you know, a froth with, with a beer in his hand. Hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what is, the, what is this, uh, this adventure? Because you guys have been kind of, well, frothing at the mouth, actually, trying to, before, ahead of playing this game. You've been uh, itching to play it, like uh, the fungus between a tramp's toes. So uh, what is it all about? Yeah, I think we first saw it at, um, was it Aircon? Yeah, it was Aircon, yeah. Yeah, and we sort of didn't have enough time to go and relook really at it properly. So we sort of rushed past it and had a very quick intro. And both of us left thinking, that sounds really good. It's like Talisman, but good. Sorry, sorry did, did, did that just come out of your mouth cage? Bloody well, hell. We all um, heard it. Everyone's heard it now. It's official. Uh, at some point, you've got to give in, haven't you? No one's ever going to agree <laughs> with me that it's a good game. So I might as well <laughs> pander to the audience. <laughs> Or C sense as the rest of it will call it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes the masses are right. <laughs> I'm still optimistic that the masses might see sense, but yeah. Well, this mass, and, and to be fair, this is a growing mass given my age, uh, will will actually have to play it and become educated, so I will concede that. Well, it's funny actually, this game is has been likened to Talisman a lot because the basic principles are roughly the same. What, your old so dice and it's not very good? That seems harsh. <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> Come on, you're going to throw something like that, I'm going to bat it out of the park. Come on. <laughs> I shouldn't throw underarm, should I? <laughs> so, similar to Talisman, it is a game with a series of locations, which are actually a set of uh, cards, you deal them out to the map is... Same locations come out every game, but the location of them, where they are, will change from game to game. The city, which is like the market space, sits in the middle. And it follows a similar concept to a lot of kind of cooperative fantasy adventure games like Mistfall and Pathfinder card game, in that you basically move to a space, draw a card. So, in fact, you know, very similar to Talisman, you go to a space, draw a card, Pathfinder's the same. It's a cooperative game. So you're not working against each other like you are in Talisman. You're you're supposed to be working together, yeah. and there's no kind of co- competitive aspect to it at all. Yeah, this one's fully caught. But what you have got is um, like a, a story you've got to complete. So it's not like a I wouldn't really call it a quest, but it is a quest. You're trying to get something, some kind of major item at the end of it. It's sort of a series of quests, really. Yeah, it's it's. it's I think it actually is it called a saga. Sounds about right. So you've got it's basically like a five stage quest. So you've got to do five things in order to do this, and what they basically mean is you've got to collect cards by beating them on the board, which have certain keywords. Yeah. So the story might say, "Oh, you met a man in a swamp, which told you the way to where the treasure was located." So that means Sorry, have... I'm going to have to interject. That reminds me of Black Adder, the second series. <laughs> Do you know the way to the wise woman? The wise woman! The wise woman! Yes, yes, the wise woman. <laughs> Two <laughs> things must ye know of the wise woman. <laughs> that was a swamp, you know. Thank you, old crone. Here is a bag of money, which I'm not going to give to you. <laughs> anyway, sorry. But it, it's the, the concept is a little bit like that. You know, you, you, the story on your card will say, oh, you go meet a wise woman in a, in a swamp. So the cards you have to collect is you have to collect a card which has the swamp keyword on it, which usually means you've got to go to a swamp location. Yeah. And you've got to pick up a stranger, which is one of, the, one of the encounter cards that will appear on these. You'll have to go to that and persuade them to join you. 
And by persuade, <laughs> I either means persuade in the traditional sense, where you try and encourage someone to politely come along with you, or the alternative, of course, is to just bash them over the head. Nice. You in- introduce uh, La- Lady Jugular to Mr. Fothing- Fossington Switchblade. <laughs> Something like that. Now, there are a couple of interesting concepts in this. Number one, it's got the huge normal kind of fantasy tropes of you pick a race and you class. So you can have, you know, your elf mage, but they can also have an elf fighter or a dwarf wizard or a dark elf assassin and things like that. And you can either pick these when you begin and try and fit the story sets to them because there's these set little stories. Or you can just go completely random and end up with something completely bonkers, yeah. which can end up with some quite interesting combinations. But I quite like the fact that Unlike other games where you tend to get a particular card will be like, it's an elf, and so it's going to be very dexterous. They always tie lots of specific traits to specific races. This one's Mm. a bit more sort of um, freeform. So, for example, you might get uh, an elf that's a really clumsy bastard. Or I guess you could have like a dwarf who's like uh, afraid of the dark. You have an elven darts player, a massive beer belly and a squint in one eye. Uh, it wasn't the first thing that sprung to mind, but I, I quite like that there's that randomness about the actual characters. Like, if you're going to be the troll, you're going to be enormously strong. Or if you're an elf, you're going to definitely be good at shooting things. Yeah, I quite like that, that uh, little touch. Mm. So the race is pretty much almost cosmetic rather than trait building? No, not entirely. You, you, you've got a class which get, uh, decides what upgrades you're going to get. But then if you imagine the race gives you bonuses on top of that. Right. So you've got basically you've got three you've got three stats to consider. You've got fighting, magic, and persuasion. Interesting. And so each each class has certain stats and each race has certain stats. So think of it like your D D characters almost. You know, you can you go for your elf wizard because you go they get a bonus for intelligence, which makes them better at magic. Mm-hmm. You know, you go for your dwarf fighter because he's got high constitution, so we better it would have more hit points. It's that slight kind of thing. So certain combinations would work better. You know, the John okay. ended up in yeah, the last sure, game sure. with the dark elf assassin, so his dexterity. No, it was, there was another ability, wasn't there? There was your, your sneak or dexterity. Yeah. So so it was strength, magic, dexterity, and persuasion. So your dark elf assassin, being a dark elf, had high dexterity, and being an assassin, gave him high dexterity. So every time John had to do a dexterity test, he had to put grab all the dice and roll them. In fact, okay. and roll them a couple of times. <laughs> yes. Wow. So is it a D6 system? Yeah, so it's D6, similar to, say, Arkham Horror and Eldritch Horror, you have to need a number of successes right. and each five or six is a success. What's quite interesting is you get a number of actions each round, and when you're trying to do, uh, trying to defeat one of these things, so let's, for instance, you're doing one of the dungeon cards, it will say, oh, you need uh, to get six successes using dexterity, for instance. Well, even if you've got, say, a dexterity of three, so you're only rolling three dice, what you can do is you can, uh, your, your successes accumulate over the round. Mm. So you can keep giving it a go, but they wipe at the end of the turn. So a few of you uh, can okay. have a go at one buddy and sort of gradually uh, drag him down. <laughs> it's like, like Monty Python and the Holy Grail. We just The head starts biting your ankles. <laughs> Pretty much, yep. Yeah, so you can be you, you don't have to be really good at something. It's it's a great that balances out this kind of thing where oh right, I need dexterity, my dexterity is one, I can never do this. You can, but it's going to take you more actions to do it, kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, presumably during that time, then you are more likely to get a kicking from something that's quite hard. Well, if you're attacking um, something else, there's a good chance it's going to be attacking back. And when they hurt you, it's really bad. Really, <laughs> yes. really bad. This this game is quite nasty with the damage because what it does is it links actions to health. Hmm. So you start the game with five health and five actions, but if you lose any health, you lose an action for that round as well. This sounds... Sorry, this, this sounds similar to that other RPG you guys played. Is it Faith? Yeah. Where the more, the more of a kicking you get... Um, the fewer things you can do. Yeah, similar it was mechanism, it had that yeah. similar mechanism, yeah. Okay. Um, now, the other thing that happens is it's called the gloom of Kilthorpe because the gloom is coming in and basically it's, it's a cooperative game, so the aim of the game is to defeat the demons. But what they're doing is they're turning all these locations to gloom. So at the end of every round, you turn over a card and they'll have an event in the locations. The event triggers and the location will turn over to the gloom side, which is basically got the same artwork on, but kind of all the colour drained out of it and misty and dark. 
Yeah. And if you end your turn in one of these gloomed locations, you lose a health as well. Gosh. Now, at the beginning of the game, this is really nasty because you've only got five health, and as soon as you start losing health, you start being in a bit of trouble. Mm. So do you gain health then? Yeah, so as you go up a level, you gain health and gain more actions. So the game kind of speeds up a bit okay. as you progress further into it. But it also meant that about half of the game, I didn't care about the gloom because I had <laughs> abilities to heal. Yeah. And so I was just like, oh, I don't care about the gloom. I'll just carry on. Oh, that's rubbish. The other problem I had with the game, which we actually had a few problems with this game, so yeah. we could be here a while saying some <laughs> of the issues. So let's just, let's, just get, let's just say that out from the bat. I think Sh- shall I get Left Bank would, 2 playing again? We didn't hate the game. We just felt a bit disappointed by it, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. I think part of that is both of us were quite excited about it. So having seen a quick preview of it, we built it up in our own minds. And so it's going to have to be fairly amazing not to disappoint us. So, yeah, there were just a lot of niggles, really. Yeah. The start of the rule book was not yeah. very good. The main one, the rule book, just slowed us down a lot. I'm not going to say it's a bad rule book, because oh. going through it a second time, but it definitely wasn't a good rule book. What the problem is, is a lot of the cards have got keywords on them. Mm. Um, so, for instance, a lot of the monsters, you reveal a monster and it says trap. And it took me for ages to work out what that car- what that actually meant because it didn't appear in the rules for combat, didn't appear in the rules for revealing cards. It appeared in one of two glossaries. Yeah. And it was kind of like, oh, this rule book could have been organised better so I can flip through. And even then when we got to the trap, it was like, well, does the trap activate only the first time he appears? Or does it activate every time you fight him? And it made it either a ludicrously hard mechanic. Yes. Or just a fairly difficult mechanic. <laughs> yeah. The other thing as well, I never felt I was in any peril. I mean, the first game we played, there was a point when I died. And when you die, you go back to the tower, you go back to the city in the centre of the game table, and you only get to start the game with two health. So basically, you either need to find some gold to get your health back up, or if you've got cards to heal. Because healing is quite actually quite difficult. I wonder if part of that was because we had to look so much stuff up in the rule book and trying to spend five minutes at a time working out where that specific rule was, yeah. whether that slowed it down. And if once we'd played it a few more times and that got yes. a bit quicker, we'd then start uh, to feel a bit more pressure more quickly, perhaps. Well, I say that again because you can play the game solo, and I played the game solo the following week, and I played a game in an hour. Yeah, okay. Right through to completion, completing killing the demon, whereas me and you took about four hours to play it, didn't we? And we didn't finish. Not really. No, we did. Yeah, but we got rid of one of the monsters. <laughs> well, yeah, because I wasn't. There, there was no difficulty setting. So it's 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 got that kind of Arkham Horror kind of uh, pandemic kind of cooperative game mechanic. So what's supposed to happen is there's a set number of rounds, and each round there's 25 locations on the board, so there's 25 turns, and each turn the gloom occurs, and then each of the four demons you can choose is a fi- has got an affiliation with one of the location types. So I think it's Badlands. Badlands, mountains, forests and swamps, I think. And when one of those cards crops up, what you're supposed to do is take a card off the demon deck, which puts like a... Something else which makes the demon harder, isn't it? Yeah. So gradually, over time, they get tougher. But they get tougher, but you don't have to fight that demon until you get right to the very end of the game. Yeah. So you could basically ignore these penalties for 95% of the game, and it's like, right, okay, I need to clear them up now. Yep. Which is pretty much what we did. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I played against Solo, I did exactly the same thing. And I found that most of the penalties that come out said, oh, your abilities from your allies don't work. I was like, well, I haven't got any allies. All right, then. Off we go, then. <laughs> so it sounds a bit swingy, either because there's no threat, I suppose. It sounds really straightforward until you get to one of the big bads, at which point you got your arse handed to you. To be fair, there was one bit where Steve had lost some life and therefore some actions. In fact, he was down to about two or three actions in a turn. And when even moving around the board costs one action, that did start to look a little bit desperate. But he did get out of it. I mean, it took you a couple of turns to get back to the middle to get some money to get some more health, but but then you were back on the up and up. Hmm. It doesn't sound tremendously exciting from what you two have been saying, I have to admit. My juices are not flowing at the thought of this game, let's put it that way. Well, I'm wondering if I'm missing something, because I've been looking at some reviews online, and most people seem to be rating it a lot higher than I currently am. <laughs> Which makes me wonder whether I've missed something. But as I said, after we played with John, and I thought I thought this when I played with John, so I played it again solo just to make sure that I 
you know was 100 percent getting it right and i just felt that no it was it was the same experience it was quicker because i knew the rules better there's just been a new kickstarter hasn't there so do you think it's possible that with the new version there'll be some new rules that makes everything a little bit better yes the the, the second kickstarter is going to have a new rule book so that should make it at least easier to navigate. And I thought the Kickstarter added expansions, which added more variety, but I'm not quite sure if it's going to change the overall game. Mm. Sounds like it, it's possible that we're just, you know, miserable old curmudgeon, Steve, because uh, it's right in me that uh, David Turksey mentioned me today on Facebook when there was a, um, an old discussion about uh, Petricor, because uh, <laughs> we didn't go for it hugely. And uh, he's just commented that the, the first um, user reviews on board, the first two user reviews on Board Game Geek are a lot more positive than Andy found it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that. In fact, I just saw somebody commenting on a on one of the Facebook groups today, basically saying board gaming getting more negative. We're all turning into video gamers because a lot more people are saying games are rubbish. And but almost everyone came back with the same answer, which is, well, there's a hell of a lot more board games available now, so we can afford to be cheesy. Mm. And the problem I've got with Kaluma Killforth is it's not a bad game, but it's so similar to a few other games. That it's it's in direct competition, and I just don't quite think it beats them out on that competition. It sounds like it's suffering from uh, Clans of Caledonia syndrome as well. Everyone seems to be going berserk for that, and it's just like it's kind of just very similar to everything else. I've got like the Pathfinder card game, and I can't help but feel that Pathfinder card game gives you the same experience, but quicker and with a more a more cohesive, cooperative feel. Okay. You know, we're saying like this War of Mine felt a, li- a lot like a solo game that yes, you could play with yes, more players. Yes, yes, yes. This felt like we were playing our own solo games each. Yeah. Oh. That was the point I was going to bring so, up. So, so there's no interaction between players then? You can't sort of say, right, I'm going to do this if you do that. The sort of interaction yeah. you get in, say, I don't know, Mansions of Madness, for example, that's very much a co op game because, you know, you need everyone else. Yeah. It's not like you're taking lots of turns to try and defeat things in parallel. You've each got your own unique quest. Oh. The one thing that you do share is if there's one thing that's particularly tough that you need to beat in order to progress your character, for example, you might find that someone else is able to help you by joining in with some co-op stabbing. (laughs) Okay. But yeah, it definitely felt like we were playing two games on the same board. Yeah. Ooh, that's rubbish. I mean, some bits of it were good fun. Yeah, I definitely agree with Steve. It did feel a bit like... We're just playing the same game at the same time next to each other. Yeah, that's disappointing. Yeah, and that's that's the phrase, actually. I think disappointing. Yeah. I think both of us were really excited about this. I think both of us feel that it's just not lived up to our own internal hype, really. Oh, dear. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. There is a lot of really nice artwork on it, on all the cards in particular, from a distance. And initially, when I looked at it, I thought, this is gorgeous. Some of the detail that's on there... But after a while, when you look a little bit closer, you just start spotting, it looks like lots of really beautiful bits of artwork that have then been stuck together with Photoshop. But sometimes it just doesn't quite match up. I mean, sometimes some of it's beautiful and I'd happily have it on my wall. Other times it just feels like something doesn't quite fit right. Oh no, have they got the perspective or the pixels slightly mismatched? No, no, it looks like what somebody's done is they've done it in Photoshop and they've kind of traced over a photograph or a stock photo. Oh. And some of them, the, the, it, you know, you, you wouldn't tell, but other ones, it kind of does look like someone's just photo- photoshopped a, a face out of a catalogue onto, <laughs> onto it, the is body like, of an orb. Is it like a ropey blue screen from the 1980s? It's, no, it's, it's not that... quite the same. It is more polished than that. The 1990s, then. It's that kind of jarring, uncanny valley in that the face looks far too good, far too highly detailed compared to the rest of the image or something like that. Mm. Oh. It's just something slightly it's... off about it. <laughs> yeah. How bizarre. So, yeah. so this is not a recommendation then, boys? Is that what we're saying? I'd struggle to recommend it at the moment, I must say. I do need to play it some more times. I really want to like this game, and I, I just really hope that my initial impression was wrong. So, yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's going to need another playthrough now we know the rules better, but 
at the moment i'm finding it difficult to recommend yeah oh you're reminding me of a game i played last night D- don't say this because we spoke we spoke online last night didn't we and yes. i think i'd like to play that game but i have a funny feeling it sounds like a ripoff of my favorite game yeah <laughs> Arkham Horror we'll cover it later. yeah yeah kind of but so yeah, so you backed it, didn't you, Steve? The Gloom of Kittlefoot. I pre-ordered it. I didn't back the Kickstarter, but I did okay. the whole late pledge kind of thing. On oh, it. that's right. I did have that whole Kickstarter disappointment of I pre-ordered it and I got to the expo and it was ten pound cheaper there. Ah, yes, that's right. Yeah, I remember you being pissed off. It takes a lot to get Steve pissed off, actually. I've just worked out what the sound is in the background. It's uh, it's the fan on my MacBook. It's been humming. For some reason, it appears to be running rather hot right now. So your MacBook fan and your wife sound similar, apparently. No, she was making noises downstairs. (laughs) Hang on. (laughs) You've been married for, what, two and a half years now, John? And you can't tell the difference between the two. All I hear is... Just noise. (laughs) My wife tells me I'm, I've got two really, really major fa- failings, you know. Um, one, not listening, and some other shit. I don't know. Kaz, <laughs> if you're listening, I didn't mean that. I was only joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in trouble on Sunday, sunshine. Uh, I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> I mean, just generally. <laughs> See, I was going to cut this section out, but I'm going to leave it in. You now. should. You should. <laughs> leave it in. Rabbit hole number two. Right. Time for some swearing. <laughs> Let's get this cut. <laughs> 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 right, so, well, the th- the second, I was going to say the third game then, but clearly I can't count. Um, it has been a long day. Um, we've all played, I think, um, Dice Forge. Oh, yes. Yes. I didn't realise you'd played this, John. I know Steve had it at Expo. I didn't realise you'd played it as well. This is I awesome. I sneaked in there. Yeah. Did you? In well fact, done. unbelievably, I've bought it. <gasps> is this another one that we all own? Have yeah. we covered this already? Yes. I think at the end of the year, we're going to have to do a tot-up of all the games that all three of the Polyhedron Collider crew own. <laughs> There's going to be like six, isn't there? Yeah, but that should be like a gold star in any game manufacturer's uh, it's true. trophy cabinet. Do you reckon we can get it that far? Do you reckon you know they, they put on like the Dice Tower Game of the Year and they put like the Spielders Yaris? Do you reckon we're going to have like the uh, the Polyhedron Collider three for three award? <laughs> <laughs> I think it says a lot. I mean, we're not wizards; they're on the back of a game manufacturer's box, so I think we could feasibly do it. Awesome! Have you not see that tweet by uh, Richard? I didn't know. I'll I don't remember what all. game it was. I'll have to. Man looks. Man looks thing up on internet. Because I mean, I think the best we've got is a couple of quotes um, on uh, on a Kickstarter campaign saying, you know, so all right, this or words to that effect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for some Kickstarter person to use one of our completely out of context quotes. Oh, totally, yes. I need to put another one out. And you just go, it's shit, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Matt from Creaking Shelves has dared you to do that. You he know, has, I know. I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> a single one-line review. It's shit, mate. If a lot of our reviews are coming out negatively, maybe we should just have a badge that says something like, uh, PHC says it's not completely shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Wow. They'll be, they'll be piling to buy it in droves. Andy didn't say it was bollocks. Well, we better buy this one then. Did you ever see... Um... Did you ever watch any of the video game or YouTube stuff from a few years back? They all went to E3 and you get these kind of Game of the Show awards and all like IGN and GameSpot and Giant Bomb all do little badges. You know, they're about six inches across that this people in E3 stick on their stand. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so Video Game, we did a load of joke ones. So it was things like most overhyped game or most unrealistic expectations set from a public demo or things like that. Well, like Destiny. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. But the best one was the least likely to be shit award. (laughs) 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 Which they gave to Witcher 3. And on Witcher 3's website, there was like a pan of all the awards they get out. And it was bang in the middle. It was dead center. (laughs) Proving that they have a sense of... Apparently Witcher 3 is quite good, actually. Even Yahtzee liked it. I've got it. I haven't played it yet. I've played Witcher 2, but I haven't played Witcher 3 yet. It's been on my... PS4 for some time, but mm. my shelf of shame on the PS4 actually puts my 
board game shelf of shame to shame. Good, good lord. Yeah, my my Steam my Steam catalog probably does that. There's quite a few games on my actual shelf that I haven't played yet. There's like Anno twenty seventy. I've installed it, got as far as the introduction, and here is here is the uh, the tutorial. It'll take only about three hours. <laughs> that <laughs> at which point I closed it down and I haven't played it again. We were talking about Dice Forge. We, we barely, yes. Um, <laughs> so Dice Forge, yes. It's yeah. We, we've all played it. It was great. I think I'm, I'm probably the last player to play this. Actually, and behind the curve compared to you two boys, that's unheard of. Uh, and he played it relatively recently. Uh, so I, play, I think I played it two weeks ago. I bought it about three or four weeks ago from um, kind person on the uh, UK board gaming and chat group. Um, so basically they, they never played it they punched it and that was it so it's basically a brand new game pre-punched for me for my convenience for a, a discounted price which is quite nice um, why would you do and... that why would you buy a game punch it and not even play it I don't know I don't know because a lot of people do that uh, I, I don't understand that there's a lot of gay people on that group and there's another uh, board game trading group who sell games in shrink hey they buy it and then go oh, I've changed my mind I don't want that anymore yeah, maybe they would. <laughs> maybe they did what I do, sort of buy it and then you know instantly regret it and then sell it on. Maybe they seriously, do what I, I mean, do. at least I go on. Ask for it for a birthday present. Think they've not got it. <laughs> Get it twice buy it themselves, <laughs> and then realise they got it twice. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, but, but again, I, I, even 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 the ones I I sort of buy on a whim, I'm like I still play it, and then decide, yeah, it's all right, and then you know never play it again. But I I have hoarding syndrome. I've seen this weird trend with both. Games that come out and Kickstarter games where people will decide to sell it based on the reviews. So they've already bought it and go, Oh, I've seen the reviews and everyone says it's rubbish, so I'm gonna get rid of it now. <laughs> it's like are you not, you're not capable of your own opinion. Apparently not, no. They just lie on the floor and wait for somebody to stamp on their face and tell them what to do. Stop it, sheep, <laughs> wake up. Well, to be fair, Steve, when opinions are already there on the internet, I mean quality opinions like ours. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you need to form your own? Because, you know, three intelligent John's gentlemen right, to be fair, already you know. uh, worked out whether the game's good or not. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not go too far there, John. Gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> you were very gentle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not a man, though. Wait. <laughs> so Dice Forge, then. <laughs> <laughs> You know it's going badly when Andy brings us back on topic. Good God, <laughs> yes. Wow. This, is, so this yes, is amazing. Dice Forge is a good game, I thought. It is a good game. It is very enjoyable. Right, um, that's done. Okay, right, next. next. Right, yeah. Um, it's beautiful as well. It is. It really is really, really pretty. Uh, the artwork's great. And the rules are fantastic, even though the first time I played it, I managed to screw them up. <laughs> Thankfully, quickly rectified. Because basically, the, the, the idea is that you, you can build your own dice. You can change the faces of the dice uh, to suit yes. your, I say need, but obviously it's based on dice rolling. So there is a, a random element of chance in there. Yeah. And you will almost invariably never get the face you've just bought. Ever. Ever. Yeah. So yes. everyone starts with the same faces, so the same opportunities. Yes. yes. You have two dice, and the idea is simply to accumulate points, and you do that by buying cards. Those cards cost certain resources. It's either is it moon and fire or something like that. Purple and red, basically. There are blue gems, red gems, uh, gold are basically the main currencies of the game. And most of the time on your dice, you'll probably acquire gold, although you can change the faces to acquire straight VPs or red or blue or purple or whatever the hell colour it is. My eyes don't work. Apparently it's purple, but I just saw blue. No, it's blue and red. Ah! See, I thought it was blue. I thought, apparently it's purple, but, you know, what do people with working eyes know? It could just be that my memory is shit. Your eyes are broken. No, and it's, in all it's probability, bluish. Someone else I, is I'll right. cut it blue. See, it's it. Right, I'm going to go back to the people that told me that I was wrong. Play this podcast back to them. See? However, I've been told off because I'll say, oh, that's purple and amanda will go no that's mauve <laughs> what the hell is mauve go, what the hell is that's mauve? not that's not a color that's like saying peach is a color no peach is a fruit not a color <laughs> get out where's your stance and orange it's that episode of coupling all over again Ooh. isn't it <laughs> mm. see men seeing 16 colors that's it we've got basically the zx81 palette that's what we've got <laughs> i think 16's generous <laughs> black white 
Red, or actually, well, I can't see red because my eyes are broken, so that's that out. <laughs> so, so where, where's me and where's me and John are like a Commodore sixty four? You're like a ZX Spectrum, then, are you? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. With half its <laughs> colours removed, it's just terrible. I am literally a dog. I see in shades of grey and maybe brown. Well, a broken ZX Spectrum is all shifted to one end. You know, like someone's put a magnet <laughs> too close to the TV. <laughs> <laughs> or they smack the tape drive slightly too hard and it won't read the tapes anymore <laughs> every single That's image it. that loads is slightly distorted <laughs> kids today you won't get this one sorry no and do, do you ever do you not remember whenever you loaded stuff off a tape drive i even remember thinking this back in the day it's like why do they spend 10 minutes loading that bloody picture line by line when you just Take it off. Don't bother loading the loading picture. And just load the f- game instead and save everyone 10 minutes of their lives. It's all about the user interface. <laughs> it wasn't an interface. It was just the loading screen. You've got to load it up so that people at least know that something's going on, so that you know the tape's going around and it's actually doing something. <laughs> so you've got to load the loading screen to make sure that the loading game is loading. <laughs> just to give you an indication that it's even going. <laughs> Or to give you an ind- indication of where to smack the tape drive so it carries on loading. Some really close friends of ours used to have Gauntlet for one of those systems. And it used to take like an hour to load that game. The mm. tape they had with it on had a glitch about 50 minutes in. So it was basically 50-50 oh. chance whether or not it was actually going to finish. So you set this thing off, go for a walk, because that's what kids in the 80s did. And when you got back, you'd be like, oh, just... Please tell me you've loaded. <laughs> Balls. It's done it again. <laughs> See, I, I had a similar problem with my copy of Gauntlet 2. It loaded yep. the game fine, but when you got to about level 50, it wouldn't load level 51. There was a problem with the tape. You're like, no! Harsh. <laughs> it just sat there. You're like, oh, never mind. Anyway, Dice Forge. Dice Forge. <laughs> <laughs> So that's our review of Dice Forge. It's <laughs> it belting. <laughs> but it is really straightforward. This is the thing. So at the start, everyone it's... takes a turn. There's it's, It supports up to four players. Um, at the start of everyone's turn, you each roll your dice and you gain the resources that sit on the dice. And then when it's your mm. go, you spend gold or whatever resource you want to buy a, dice, a die face or uh, a card that will give you an additional special ability, either an ongoing effect or a one-time thing and or some points. And there's, depending on how many players there are, there's between eight and ten rounds. Was it nine and and ten rounds? And that's it. You carry on. It's really, it's, it's what, half an hour to an hour, if you get a shift on? Yeah. It took us two, but everyone was pissing about. (laughs) And that's it. It took two hours. Oh, don't, seriously. I had to keep reminding everyone, roll your dice! Oh, yeah! Yeah, that's one of the nice bits. Whenever anyone rolls their dice... Everyone rolls their dice. Mm. So at the beginning of everyone's turn, everyone rolls all the dice. So you get a chance to get some more stuff based on whatever you rolled. And each time it's your turn, you get an opportunity to upgrade your dice. Mm. And that's the bit I screwed up because I didn't realise at the start, because I basically misread the rules. This is entirely on me. That I didn't realise you rolled your dice at the start of everyone's turn. I just thought you start you rolled mm. them at the start of your turn. So I thought the fourth player is getting really screwed over here. That would be a very different game. It really is a tough game, actually, when you do it like that. The fourth player is at a distinct disadvantage. Like Iron Man Dice Forge. <laughs> and and that's it. There's two sets of cards in it. There's like a beginner's set and then a, a sort of a turbo advanced set. And obviously you can mm. mix and match them depending on how sassy you're feeling. And that's basically it. There's a couple of mechanics that you can oust people from the spots that they're on when they've bought a card. And there's a limited number of cards. So once they're gone, they're gone. So you've yeah. got to sort of get a shift on. Uh, there's four... Well, there's a number of cards of each type per player. And once they're gone, they're gone. And that's basically it. So you add all your points up and done. There is one other little bit, uh, one other little mechanic. When you go out and go and get some of the upgrades on the board, you uh, put your little meeple down. And depending on someone else going there as well, you then get some rewards from them visiting the same spot. Yeah, you oust them. Yeah. Mm. I thought that That's was quite, quite neat because it also It is a nice touch, yeah. There is some kind of reward for being the first person to reach that spot because if someone else then pops along, you then get some bonus from it. But it means you're constantly thinking, should I put people down there to get some instantaneous reward or to try and upgrade my dice? Or as I did, let's just get all the gold on all the dice. 
only to realise I've got a million gold, <laughs> but I've not even got anywhere to put it. So it's kind of a bit of a waste. I've just got all the gold and no points. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Steve did that at Expo as well. He, he loaded his dice, one of his dice up with the six gold thing. Yep. Steve, you don't need yeah, any more it's, gold, It's mate. a really cheap purchase. It's a really, it really cheap is. purchase. You go like, oh, it's, that's a really easy one. Why do you get the new realise, like... Five turns in, it's like, oh, that's why that gold is so gold face is so cheap because it does not help you late game. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really doesn't. Unless you have the blacksmith thing, which you can just trade gold for points, but you need a lot of them. Yeah, mm. but uh, no, it's it's uh, it's a great little game. Very easy to play, very easy to learn, very quick to set up. And I have to say, one of the best inserts and way of packing a game I have ever seen. Oh, God, yes. It is stunningly good. Every detail has been considered. The insert is perfectly designed for the contents. It's brilliant. They even tell you how to put it all back together. It's superb. It's up to mechs versus minion standards. Yes, I would agree. It is belting. They've Mm. done a sterling job. And I can't remember who who makes it now. We ought to have a special class of games which have really good packaging. <laughs> the polyhedron, a polyhedron Clyde, a seal of packaging approval. <laughs> it would fit in our package. <laughs> the, t- <laughs> the tasty looking package reward. <laughs> PHC tasty package. I like it. Nice. <laughs> who does Dice I think Forge? It's, um, it's, um, oh. I think it's Lily, Lily. I can never pronounce it. Lily Bud. Lilliput. Lilliput sounds right. Oh, the people who did Mysterium. Yes. Oh, um... So it's, it's part of Asthma Day. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Le, 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 Le Bellard. That's it, Le Bellard. yeah. Yes. So it's 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 part of them, so it's them, so it's basically part of Asthma Day. Mm. But it is, it's it's really good. It's really fun, dead yeah. easy, brilliant game. And I, I can foresee many an expansion for this in the near future. Yes, that's a cash cow waiting to happen, isn't it? Oh, just imagine a D20 version of one of them. <laughs> That'd be amazing. It could be very fiddly, <laughs> unless it was massive. It would have to be massive. It'd have the size of a football, wouldn't it? Or a hacky sack or something. Has anyone managed to get a dice face into their pint yet? Not no. quite. I, I, it landed in my dinner. I always felt like I was going to break them off. <laughs> Like as in snap one of the faces that I was using to lever a different face off with. Oh, they're, they're quite they're quite yeah. robust. They even tell you how to lever the faces off. How good is this manual? It's brilliant. It is. It's very good. So, PHC recommended, I would say. Indeed, I would say so. Yeah, given that we yeah. all, all three of us have it, you know, either we, none of us have got taste, or it's quite a good game. Take your pick. Pick. Take your pick, listeners. Yeah. Actually, no, don't. One. It's a really good game. <laughs> now I've played something that you two haven't. Yes, you bum, have. Bum, You've played bum. an RPG. I have been playing an RPG, and it is because I'm a massive nerd. Um, Whereas you know, me and Steve, just cool. <laughs> <laughs> and you, 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 you know, you kiss ladies on the mouth and things like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you kiss them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> I have been playing the recently released, and I say recently released because Paul, our DM on this, has literally received his super turbo mega ball cube edition of this today on the, what date is it, 8th of November now? Wednesday. And it turned up and it's about the size of a small car. Are you going to tell the listeners what it is? This is the Star Trek RPG from... um, Modiphius. Modiphius, thank you, yes, them. They're quite big. Right. And it's... I haven't actually seen... Because the, 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 the Super Turbo Edition, which is an RRP of £395. Sweet baby Jesus. <laughs> exactly. It's like 300 second, quid. 400 quid. 400 quid? Yes. That's insane. But holy shit, it's a thing of beauty. It's a Borg cube. And it's about the size of a Borg cube. It's a one-to-one scale model. <laughs> it's crazy. It's got drawers and books and a board and mini. It's br- it's brilliant. But I say, I've not seen it yet. I've just seen a picture. But I've seen the picture on Paul's desk, and it is huge. You can see the desk bowing under the weight. For 400 quid, I think I'd want it to be more than just amazing. I think I'd want some sort of favours with that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it comes with its own, you know, sort of uh, attractive models as well. They're about, you know, 30 mil tall. You can paint them and... Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, yes, yeah, so it's an RPG. We have the um, pre-release rulebook, 
And before anyone says, is it hooky, Andy? No, it's legit. We didn't skank it <laughs> off some rupee website. And we started playing the RPG a few weeks ago. So there are four of us on this uh, crew. Uh, and scarily enough, I'm the captain. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God, they let you do that, did they? <laughs> they didn't. None of them wanted to be the captain. So, you know, I, I obviously magnanimously stepped up to lead this um, ragamuffin crew. By any uh, chance into, did you step uh, up unknown. before they had a chance to? <laughs> I did not. No, I was last to... Actually, no, Nye was last to join. He wanted to be the captain, but I pipped him to it. But I was fourth <laughs> to join. No, third to join. Third to join. So it's like, yeah, that'll do. I can be that. So I am playing a Betazoid telepath who has a drinking problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's 50% based on your actual character then. <laughs> exactly. You're supposed to role play someone, Andy, not just play yourself. <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely not telepathic. It's fine. I don't drink martinis in real life. I'm role playing, all right? In fact, one of the first things you get this sort of introductory mission, but it's basically kind of like the 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 hook, so everyone sort of meets up. Uh, and ours was based on this sort of little planetary exercise where we had to end up. We we sat in a. If for anyone who watches Star Trek, you're in a runabout. For anyone who doesn't watch Star Trek, it's got kind of, a runabout. It's kind of like a big shuttlecraft with a few. You know, it's, it's basically like the sort of the semi-detached version of the house rather than the cottage that you run around. And we all sort of met up on this planet that was uh, had this disease, basically. And we crash-landed, and one of the first things to die, and the first thing, as I said, send the, the, the chief engineer, who happens to be Nye, who is an octogenarian, <laughs> this dribbling, piss-stained old man. <laughs> He's playing it really grumpy. He's doing really well. Uh, the first thing I set him to do was repair the replicator so I could get a decent martini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's a 2d20 system. So the idea is that you have 12 stats, six of which are in one category and six of which are in the other. And usually what you'd have is when you do a test, you'll pick, you'll have one from one category and one from the other. You add the two numbers together and you've got to roll 2d20s. You roll that number or lower to get a success and if you get a, a one then you get two successes if you get a 20 you get like a it's basically a critical fail and the dm has what are called threat tokens and the players gain momentum tokens so if you roll more successes than the test difficulty you gain a success uh, a momentum token for every sort of more success than you need um, so you can store them up to a maximum of six so if you want to roll more dice to do a particularly hard test you can spend some momentum to buy some more dice they, they get progressively more expensive there's only a limit to how many you can buy so when um, you're on a roll you are literally on, on a, roll. a roll. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Oh, but cool. you can choose also to buy more dice, even if you don't have enough momentum. But in doing so, you give the DM a threat token. So you can choose to spend that threat token to make your life more difficult later on. So, you know, pleasure and pain and all that. So a bit like the um, bit like the force token from the Star Wars system. But, um, so the, the FFG Star Wars system, there's a, there's a force dice you know, there's a dark side and a light side, and it, it will give you bonuses, uh, but it's a flip to, flippable token. So when it's on the light side, the player characters can use the force dice, uh, but it flips back over to the dark side, and they can't use it again until the DM rolls the dark side dice. Oh, nice. And flips it back. Nice. <laughs> Um, not similar, but obviously there's there's two yeah. sets of tokens. So yeah, similar similar sort of idea. So you can push your luck a little bit, but of course you know it'll come to back to bite you on the arse if you push it too far. You suddenly um, realise you're giving away your firstborn child. <laughs> pretty much, yes. Um, and one thing I really like about the game is that it's very freeform. The rule book's a bit faffy, I have to admit. The first sort of hundred and odd pages. If you've ever watched an episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation, you don't need that hundred pages because it's literally just introducing all the races and how the game works and all the sort of the, the fluff uh, about the Star Trek universe. That, as I say, if you've ever watched Star Trek in your life, uh, which obviously this game is pretty much geared towards, you don't really need to read that. Now I say that because I've seen every single episode of Star Trek ever, many times, but um, and memorized them all. Uh, pretty much, yeah. I even know the <laughs> names of a lot of the episodes at the moment. But anyway, because I'm rewatching Next Gen. Just a quick aside. What's your thoughts on Discovery? It's shit. Um, I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about four episodes in. I'm enjoying it, but it doesn't feel it doesn't feel quite like Star Trek at this point. No, it does not. I 
I have to say, once you get past episode three, so kind of the first three episodes are like the intro, uh, yeah. it does get better. Yeah. I've seen up to six now, so and four to six are a lot better than one to three. But I don't like I don't like the blingons. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean actually, with the pink bits on top of their uh, their girly battle yeah. dresses. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I don't like what they've done with because the thing is they're plotting lots and they're honestly more like Romulans than they are like Klingons, and I don't like it. It just doesn't feel right for the Klingons. I know it's obviously covering the backstory about the Civil War and how the Klingon Empire came together and all that sort of jazz, but I just, I, I no. And the idea of redemption for Michael, the main character, is quite cool. Um, that's quite a nice sort of undercurrent. And Spoiler I have to say, I quite... <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, sorry. Hmm. <laughs> that's not a massive spoiler. But um, she ends up on the, sh the ship Discovery. And I'd say that the, the captain of Discovery is cool. He's a lot more like Malcolm Reynolds, though. <laughs> I, I was going to yeah. say that I, was, I, was, I wasn't quite enjoying the first two episodes. And then Jason Isaacs turns up as the captain and plays a complete hard ass. And I thought, yep, that's it. I'm in now. I, I just ignore. I, I'm actually not that interested in what's happening to Michael. More, right, what's Jason Isaacs going to do in the next scene? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, the main character, Michael, is a bit bland. Yeah, the combination of that captain and uh, the gay chief engineer and then add to that some slightly twisted stuff that's going on that you're not quite sure about, which I won't spoil for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. But there's a couple of moments where you just look at it and you're like, what the f*** was that? <laughs> Ooh, yes. Yeah, that's quite cool. Okay. And yes, the uh, the water-based space cow, that was interesting. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's. I, I need to watch episodes sort of seven, eight, and I guess nine now since I've seen it. I can't remember how many of them have been since I last saw it, but just to see what happens. But I'm not. I, I, I agree with you. You're right, Steve. It's an interesting series, but it ain't Star Trek. Mm. I think you worry too much about that. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> you're you're so easy to please, John. You you like everything. You're so nice. That's not true at all. I don't like you. <laughs> 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 well, that's that's just stating the obvious. Nobody <laughs> likes me. So anyway, sorry, that was a, a, a rabbit wormhole. Um... <laughs> See what you've done there. But yes, the Star Trek RPG is, um, what was I saying? Yeah, it's a 2D20 system, blah, 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 blah. If you're in combat, you involve a bunch of custom D6. So I think if you roll a one or a two, that their face value. So you add them together. And then five or a six are, I think they're events or the type of damage you do or something like that. Nine knows the rules. I haven't bothered reading them all yet. But basically, you roll a lot of dice and you count the number of successes and then you count the effects. Um, although I do find it quite easy, quite hilarious that I've kitted out my captain and basically he's really good at command, obviously. He's really good at the con, so he can drive, and uh, he's extremely tasty in a fight. So basically, I'm the getaway driver if something goes wrong. I'll get us into a fight and then get us out of it as well. But um, I like the free-form nature of it, because unlike D&D, which is really quite prescriptive, you know, your character sheet is extremely prescriptive and everything sort of flows from your six main stats. The, the stats you get in Star Trek are very much customizable, so, and you can change them later in the game as well, apparently. We haven't got far enough that, you know, we can, we sort of, when you level up, basically, you can start reassigning points. Like what sorts of things? What can you customize? When you build your character, you get a massive list of options about things like traits or values what, that you can choose. And the, I think it's the values that you basically make up yourself. So you can basically just design your own character. So, you know, what are these things that your character holds dear? Uh, like mine is, you know, you can always trust your right hand. And, uh, <laughs> and I, 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 chose, I chose those words <laughs> deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, you're all in it together, you know, so have a bit of a group mentality. But there are certain things like you get focuses and stuff like that, so things you're actually good at, and you can pick what they are from the book. So, like, you could be good at Star Trek, uh, Starship Recognition or Code of Justice or, you know, Planetary Landing or whatever the hell it is. And you can customise your character that way. And it's up to the character and the DM to kind of interpret when and where you want to use that skill or focus and how it applies. I quite like that. Yeah, it is. It's a really nice mechanism. I really think it's quite good because you can interpret in lots of ways and it's up to the player really to try and convince the DM, no, 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 this is totally appropriate to this situation. <laughs> I would say that's probably true of most RPGs. I mean, just generally speaking, it would be up to the players to convince the DM 
that what they're suggesting is feasible, that it's not ridiculous what they're trying to do. Some insane feat of acrobatics or something along those lines. Well, yes and no, because, I mean, say, for example, I mean, D&D is the prime example, where, like, the, D&D, the, 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 master, the DM would basically say, right, give me an athletics check. So it's pretty obvious, yeah. you know, if you're trying to rule up a wall, it's an athletics check. Yeah. Whereas okay. in Star Trek, yeah. it's not that simple, because you have... Um, stats like you have command or you have security or engineering or medicine and you also have things like um oh what are the others anyway a bunch of stats a bunch of other stats they're sort of complementary skills basically and the dm will say right this is this particular test is a combination of i don't know um engineering and um athletic uh, not athletics um um, stamina or something like that you'll add those two scores together and your character's good at some things obviously but not at the others so uh, that's how it works and you can get people to help you with a task as well because you have ongoing so there's like the short term things like you know a standard test and there's also if you get into trouble like each each session or each area each, each sort of part of the game is broken up and it's almost like you're taking part in an episode of Star Trek so it has a number of scenarios like Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 yeah and in you know there's almost always a race against time but you know you've got to do this ridiculously complicated task you know because there's a missile heading for the complex you've got to do something in two hours otherwise everyone's dead and it represents that in like a what's called a an extended term t- test and you've got to get a bunch of successes in, in in a row or whatever and then you have a milestone and it'll help you out and then you do another bunch and so on and so forth but you can as the captain i can sort of assign crew to do certain things and they'll take it into account and use their skills to help them out and um, decide. And another thing you can really do is there's so many NPCs in it. So the DM has basically created loads of NPCs, obviously, because you have a crew. And if I do, like I did last time, you have like an away team. Now, the, the captain's not supposed to lead the away team. But the DM's like, no, no, you can totally lead it, Andy. It's fine. I said, no, 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 it's quite fine. I'm going to sit in my captain's chair with a martini and let this lot sort it out. <laughs> because one thing I did notice was that because I'm the captain, the DM obviously focused on me quite a lot because I'm the leader of the group. And I was very conscious of that because obviously I've done DMing and you don't want to focus on one person because it's not fair on everybody else. Yeah, it can get boring for the rest of the group. E- exactly. And I didn't want that to happen. So I consciously detached myself from this opportunity and said, no, no, I'm going to stay on board here. Let this lot crack on. Andy, are you feeling OK? Because that doesn't sound like you. It's very well. Basically, I just wanted to play. I just well, no, I did have an ulterior motive. It's because they were on the planet's surface doing whatever they were doing, and there were some Romulans in orbit. So I just wanted to start a Barney <laughs> on your own. <laughs> well, no, I, I obviously still had the rest. I, I was on. The, I was on that to do with the actual ship at this point. So I got to choose. We got to choose the ship as well that we're on. So we're on an Akira class warship. Obviously, uh, that we've kitted out for uh, hard ass decks. Oh no, it was a group decision. I was I was going to go for the sovereign class, you know, the Enterprise E, but uh, Paul couldn't do it because he didn't have the rules for it. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted after that, I wanted the Defiant, and he said, "No, you can't. You can have a Defiant class ship, but you're not getting a cloaking device." God damn it, Paul! That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. It wouldn't be fair on the DM or the story for that. No, matter. it would not. No, no. <laughs> So when you crafted all your characters, did you all do that in isolation? Like, did you find out that you've got three people, all great at command, all great at driving, and all brilliant at talking to people? Or did the DM kind of try and balance it all out between you? No, we chose... We kind of... Well, everyone had kind of chosen the sort of character they wanted to play ahead of time. And then we all sort of discussed who wanted to do what. So, I mean... Before I joined, um, Derek had p- picked, he was going to be the sort of ship's counsellor and sort of medic, sort of head, basically chief medic, medical officer. Nye was going to be chief engineer. Will had chosen to be an ensign. So, I mean, you've got loads of different characters and, and positions you could play. I mean, geez, you could be the transport chief if you wanted to be. <laughs> Have you seen that webcomic about, uh, what's the guy's name? Chief O'Brien. Where he's just yes. stood there in the transporter <laughs> room. Doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, every episode, he's like, so would you like me to beam you up? And everyone says, no, no, it's fine. We'll just take a shuttlecraft. Don't need to worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, so I remember that. Just standing there whistling. <laughs> yeah. He just gets so depressed throughout this whole series. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's crushing, but funny. <laughs> Uh, but you could be anything. And this is one of the reasons we wanted, um, we decided against having the Defiant, as fun as it would be, because I just wanted to start a war with Romulus. That we decided we we're actually going to go for a sovereign class or a galaxy class originally. 
Um, again, the Enterprise D, basically, so the next generation ship, um, because it would allow our characters to basically have a role on the ship, because the Defiant is, is, a, is a very tight warship, so there's not much room on the ship on one of them for a for, you know, ship's counsellor or something like that. So we thought, well, if we have something with a population on it, there's a bit more opportunity for the characters to flourish and do their own thing. Bit and it seems to be variety. working quite well. So we've gone for an Akira class. So again, for those of you who aren't too familiar with Star Trek, the Akira class was made to basically fight the Borg and the Dominion. Um, so they're very, very new ships in the Star Trek universe. So they're sort of towards the end of Deep Space Nine and um, sort of Voyager and all that sort of jazz. So really new things, but they weren't really used. Uh, in anger in any of the series but they're just kind of there as part of the canon so we've got one of these that i've kitted out for you know space exploration and beating the shit out of new people that we encounter it's kind of kirk approach to boldly go forth and kill them all <laughs> pretty much yeah you know we come in peace shoot to kill and all that um but yeah we've encountered the romulans so far which is cool um although because derek and i are very familiar with star trek um as is paul of course our dm and we've got Nye and Will, who aren't Star Trek nerds at all. You know, like they've seen like one episode each. So they have no idea what's going on at all. I would consider myself a bit of a Star Trek nerd, but in your presence, I'm now starting to realise there's like another level. It's like when you play <laughs> oh, yeah. computer games, but you play them on single player and you think you're really shit hot. And then you go and play them online and basically you get your ass handed to you. <laughs> you suddenly realise you're like just a speck of dust in this arena yes <laughs> bang, bang. oh i'm dead oh shit respawn i'm dead oh shit yeah basically like I'm, I'm a bit of a sort of super platinum nerd when it comes to star trek but i'm not the i'm not like the guys on south park but um so did the rest find it a bit overpowering then if three of you are huge star trek fans um, i think so and that's another reason i kind of stepped back actively as the captain and sort of kind of let nye and will and um, derek get on with it i mean derek knows his way around star trek he knows it probably better than i do actually to be fair to him so did you find there was quite a lot of metagaming then? I mean, you know, more than something um, like, say, uh, D&D, for example, where they know some lore from previous campaigns. With this, you don't even need to know the system. If you just watched enough Star Trek, you probably got a pretty good idea about, well, as you said, all the kind of background information you might need to know. Yeah. It's something Derek and I have actively tried to steer, steer away from for that exact reason. However... <laughs> You I can't help, help yourself myself. sometimes. <laughs> no, exactly. The thing is, the last session we had, we had a there's sort of three acts in this sort of episode basically that Paul had crafted lovingly. So um, he, ba I did to him what he'd done to me a couple of weeks before in in D and D, where basically I ruined his day and completely bypassed the second act by star trekking the shit out of the first act. <laughs> You know, let's let's scan for this and chroniton particles and all this sort of stuff. It's like, well, clearly there's some kind of time travel device in the system. It's on the tenth planet because we found something, and the Romulans are going to be here because we've seen chroniton radiation, and that's how their warp drive works. And he just looks at me. <laughs> Turns out he's actually a Star Trek captain. <laughs> Graduated yes. from the academy with a first class honors degree. <laughs> Indeed. So yes. So Paul was amused, but kind of annoyed at the same time so we had to he basically had to uh, come up with some kind of exchange with the romulans which he did really well to be fair to him because this is the first time he's dm'd and he's coping with it really really well especially because he's got an asshole like me in the party <laughs> well the fact that you're still playing with him i mean that speaks volumes really doesn't it <laughs> oh it's brilliant it really is brilliant fun because say because it's so free form it allows the there's nothing that really ties you down to a character and there's nothing that really says you can or can't do something. Whereas in, in D&D, &D, there are certain things that you look and go, oh, I'm not really good at that. I won't try it. I'll let somebody else do it. There's not really anything in, in the Star Trek one that really stops you from doing something. I mean, yeah, you, you're probably not as good as someone else. But because there are so many combinations and so many situations that could apply, you've got to think around it more than you sort of act around it. It's not like sort of draw steel and beat the crap out of things like you do in D&D. You've got to think your way around it. And, you know, if you get shot, you're probably going to die. It's things like that because um, you don't have that many hit points and weapons are quite powerful, obviously. So um, there's a lot more thinking and interaction. There's a lot more chance. There's a lot more opportunity for pissing about as well, which is quite good. And I'm, I'm sure Starfleet Academy are going to have words with me on my return. <laughs> but uh, it is a lot of fun. <laughs> It really is a lot of fun. You sound impressed with it. We, I mean, we say we've, we've only had two sessions so far, but it is 
a lot of fun. It's 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 making your character is a bit of a, a ball ache, I have to admit, to start with, because it's not particularly clear on what happens and where you go. But that because it's so freeform, I guess. Yeah, partially. I think you you have to have at least have. A, I think it helps if you've played an RPG before that you can understand. You know how a character comes together. But to be fair, the rules are very very good at you know helping you go through. And there's even a little checklist at the end of it to make sure you've not screwed it up. Um, and it turns out I had screwed mine up, so it's actually quite helpful <laughs> that that checklist was there. It's because it's like at this point, you know, there should be a sum of, you know, if you had all these 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 stats up, it should total you know fifty six or whatever it is, and it turns was out mine was like fifty three. No, it was not <laughs> even enough. I was like, oh, how have I screwed that up then? So, so that was really helpful. So it is well written enough that it's good for introductions, but. Uh, there's, in, there's enough, and it's pretty obvious you can skip past a lot of the fluff if you're already familiar with a lot of the things. So the one thing, and because obviously I've not seen the full box set yet, that is a little restrictive in the rule book we've got is that you can only play as the Federation at the moment. But my understanding is the rules and or further expansions of it will include other races like Romulans and Klingons and all that sort of jazz. So he paid 400 quid for a Borg cube, but you don't even get to play as the Borg. Oh, no, no, no. Well, um, no, no. The, the miniatures, that they got the Borg Queen and stuff in it. I don't know, because we've only got the PDF of the sort of pre-rules, as it were. So the the Borg Cube probably contains a lot more rules than we've currently got. Uh, okay, gotcha. So the rule book we've got only covers the Federation. But I'm sure, as you say, for £400, I'm pretty sure it'll contain a lot more information than, than, than that. You'd hope so. <laughs> yeah, you can play as different races like Andorian. So Derek, uh, our medic, is an Andorian. So he's got sort of blue skin and antennas. It's quite cool. And I think it's our, our chief medical officer because yeah, because Derek's the ship's counselor rather hilariously. Chief medical officer is is also a Betazoid and uh, is uh, apparently a bit of a tease. Uh, so yeah, she she flirts with the captain, which the captain is all all too happy to uh, to indulge. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> It's basically like having Luxwana Troy on board, if you've ever seen Next Gen. Um, yeah. Deanna yeah, Troy's mum. It's like having her on board. It's basically her. So I'm basically being chased around the ship by Luxwana Troy. It's quite Except fun. you're nothing like John luc Picard, who would probably no, actually I am not. try and dissuade her in right. some way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's flirting with half the crew. It's brilliant. Um, and I say, Nye is like this, this sort of octogenarian engineer, and Will is sort of the... Uh, the, the goody two shoes ensign so it's all coming together really well i have to admit it is a lot of fun and there's a lot of banter between people um so yeah we are we are really enjoying it and, and paul's doing a really good job of it so yeah first impressions are good it sounds cool. like fun i think mm. i'd probably enjoy that i think you would so that was the star trek rpg by modiphius i've got into blockbusters now can i have a pee oh, please God. bob I have. It was brilliant. Blockbusters was ace. It You've really was. You've got too much time on your hands. I've only been really listening to the music because it was one of the best theme tunes ever made. I'm trying to think of the theme tune. All I can think is the Nightmare theme tune at the moment. Oh, no, I've got that. <laughs> oh, yes, got yeah, there you go. And it was all done on 80s synths. <laughs> and look, hosted by Bob Holness, a legend and a gentleman. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Wasn't he the first man to play James Bond? Um, yes, he did on on, on the radio. I think it wasn't on yeah. telly. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the voice. I guess Bond. I can picture it. Yes, no, he was smooth. He was basically sort of Roger Moore of the radio. So I think that's about time for us today. I don't want to oversteer our welcome, so I think that's a nice little because uh... <laughs> we never usually do, do we? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, you can do here. More, more. No, don't leave us. Oh, God, for the love of Christ, just get off the air. <laughs> so we'll be back in a week or two with a Kickstarter special. So rather than going through the games we've played, we're going to just, just discuss Kickstarter in the next episode. Yeah, what's good, what's so, bad, what we'd do better. <laughs> us with our, you know, massive business sense brains and website design skills. Actually, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Expect Kickstarter 2.0 in about three weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> I've got that ropey management qualification. <laughs> I don't. Well, I can build a website. <laughs> there you go, and I'll I'll just sit there and look pretty. <laughs> um, that's the most difficult task of all for him. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge. That's it, Andy. <laughs> look sexy. <laughs> and on that bombshell. 
<laughs> wow. I think it's time to go. Thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. We have been Polyhedron Collider. I've been Steve Tudor. I've been Andy. And I've been John Cage. We should probably ask people to leave us a positive review on iTunes, really, shouldn't we? We probably yeah, should, actually. Idea. We haven't been doing that one. So, yeah, if you've actually liked this show, I suggest going... And you listen on iTunes, of course. I, I don't know if Stitcher or uh, all the other Podbean or anything else like that has got reviews, but if you're on a fruit-based device, why not leave us a review? <laughs> yes, indeed, a positive one, obviously. We'll bid you adieu. Ted Bear. Oh, is that getting cut, Steve? Yeah, that's getting cut. God damn it.